Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in the Bible, right here on Fulfill Radio. I am William Bell, your co-host, along with Dr. Don Preston. And I believe he's here. So, Don, how are you doing? Well, I just barely made it, to be honest about it. I, uh, I know had that. been on fa- Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd been on Facebook having an absolutely remarkable, uh, sad, and uh, almost unbelievable uh, exchange with Sam Frost, who is now claiming that natural disasters, including uh, invasion by foreign armies, drought, famine, plague, etc., uh, that came on Israel were not, I repeat, not a result of Israel's violation of the law of Moses. They were absolutely in no way different than the natural plagues that come on any nation uh, by natural causes. It's just what happens uh, in life. And I, I, I'm literally staggered, to be honest about it. Uh, you know, I even hate to take the time to discuss this, but since Sam Frost is setting himself forth as the voice, the figure to refute covenant eschatology, because after all, he tells us repeatedly what an icon he was in the preterist movement. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then sometimes you have to point out, point out these uh, sad realities. But uh, I posted to him a couple of questions. I said, did God say to Israel that if they violated Torah, the law of Moses, he would bring on them drought, plague, pestilence, sickness, disease, and invasion. Did he say that those things would come on them as a direct result of violation of Torah? And naturally, Sam Frost refused to answer that. He said, are you telling me that when China, for instance, uh, experienced those things, that that was a result of violation of Torah? Uh, That's the kind of obfuscation. That's the kind of evasion. It's the kind of refusal to deal with issues that we are seeing exhibited by Sam Frost these days. Uh, It's just, um, it it truly is uh, an incredibly sad uh, situation uh, to witness the devolvement. That's the only thing that I I can call it. It's a devolvement uh, of, of Sam and his theology um, to to see him go I mean after all uh, forget covenant eschatology just think of covenant theology the post millennial uh, the uh, reconstructionist movement that has been supportive of Sam Frost <laughs> I just can't help but feel that these days uh, men such as Gary DeMar uh, even Kenneth Gentry, Joel McDermott, and what have you. I I can't help but feel that those men want to have as much distance between them and Sam Frost these days as possible. Uh, On one one of his blogs over the last couple of weeks, 
uh, Sam Frost even called these men, these very men, quote, so-called partial preterist, unquote. Now, that's, you know, I don't, I don't know how you call them so-called partial preterist. Uh, and yet, that's Sam Frost's own terminology. Uh, and so, uh, when you, but when you look at postmillennialism, when you look at Reconstructionism, they are absolutely firm advocates. They teach vehemently that God's curses, and that includes national invasion, drought, famine, earthquake, etc., would come on Israel as a direct result of her violation of Torah, the law of Moses. And yet, here's Sam Frost saying, hey, look. You got China, you got Russia, you got all these different countries. Do they ever experience famine, earthquake, pestilence? Do they do they ever experience uh, uh, armed invasion? Does that mean they're under Torah? Uh, and uh, I mean, th- this is really such. Uh, let me use my Latin term that I coined years ago: argumentum ad desperatum, uh, in order to avoid the centrality of covenant in God's dealings with Israel. I mean, if you take the position, as Sam Frost did in this Facebook exchange that I was having right up to 11 11 seconds before I logged on here, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, if, if you take that position, then you truly cannot argue that Israel even had a distinctive covenant with Yahweh at all. Period. Because those covenantal sanctions of covenantal wrath were part and parcel of God's covenant with Israel. And God said he gave his law to Israel and to no other nation. So, uh, I, again, I'm just staggered. I am deeply saddened. When I read, uh, uh, you'll, you'll have to forgive me here. Uh, when I read such nonsensical, ridiculous comments coming from a man who is claiming to be some kind of a scholar and claiming to be the voice to uh, refute covenant eschatology. And yet, when you ask him these very, very simple questions based upon the explicit statements of Scripture, you violate the covenant, I'll bring these curses on you. When he refuses to deal with those explicit statements of Scripture. And by the way, for those listening, both tonight live and for those who will listen on the archives, I recommend that you just go and you spend some time with Leviticus chapter 26. I mean, seven times God said, if you break my law, here's what I'm going to do. And those Here's what I'm going to do statements in, included famine, earthquake, pestilence, invasion, and, and captivity. Now, we take Sam Frost, newly developed, newly evolving, I call it devolvement, uh, theology, and there was absolutely nothing. There was no covenantal wrath at all to come on Israel that was in any way as a result of her violation of Torah. End of story. It's just natural phenomena that happen to any nation, every nation, in the flow of human history. Could it be possible? Go ahead. That Sam is moving in the direction of Zionism since he's having the problem dispensing with any um, judgment and uh, passing away of national Israel in the scripture? Just a question. Well, William, I have been saying, I am on record as saying, I posted it uh, on Facebook a couple of times over the last few weeks, that over the last year or so, perhaps even longer, Sam Frost has been moving almost inexorably toward dispensationalism, i.e. slash Zionism. Just this last week, Sam Frost made a post 
that indicated he did not say it verbatim, he did not say it explicitly, but he indicated that he believes that the land still belongs to Israel today. Well, let's face it. If you take the position that Israel, (laughs) which is not even biblical Israel for crying out loud, but if you take the position that the land of Israel still belongs to Israel, then if you're not headed to dispensationalism and Zionism, I honestly don't know where you're headed. Uh, And I've been saying this. I have been asking Sam. uh, Let me just finish up here. I have been asking Sam for at least a year, are you becoming a dispensationalist? He has never said emphatically no. He has said you're making false accusations. You're jumping to false conclusions, etc. He's totally evasive, totally obfuscatory, and he, re- he, he simply says things like, well, I was once a dispensationalist and I rejected that. That does not answer the question at all. And so I am convinced I may be wrong. But I am convinced, based upon things that Sam Frost has been posting over the last year and specifically over the last couple of months, that Sam is headed full steam ahead back to the dispensational camp. Well, uh, what I was going to say was I remember when I first um, was approached by Sam regarding some of the things that I was stating about Zionism, and uh, how it was definitely um, refuted through the preterist view, that he sort of took that as, um, and, you know, of course, at that time, I don't think he was, you know, necessarily leaning that direction, but he did sort of express some surprise that um, that I even brought that up, which, and, and indicated that he had some favorable leanings toward uh, Israel. And, uh, of course, I think one of the uh, statements I got from him was, um, aren't they one of our allies? Um, as if that was some scriptural justification <laughs> for acknowledging them as Israel. Now, they did do an interview with me on one of his broadcasts at the time um, to share some of the information that I had uh, you know, that I had studied on it. And, you know, I've been a person who have been pretty much on the, uh, you know, the forefront of trying to get that subject in front of many of, the, you know, many preterists for a while. Absolutely. And absolutely. And, um, so I, I'm, int- you know, just it's intriguing to hear you say that about him. But um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that is definitely, you know, the direction that he's going. So just to hear you talk about it sort of confirms some suspicions that I have as well. Well, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. And as I said, uh, I've been saying this for a long time now. You cannot take some of the positions that Sam Frost is taking right now and not wind up consistently logically in the dispensational camp. He can flail around, you know, and deny all he wants to. But... I have watched Sam devolve ever since he left preterism. I have watched Sam devolve. I have watched him develop some some absolutely incredible uh, novel, absolutely novel, uh, if not to say downright eccentric uh, theological positions. And, of course, this is all the more abundantly strange since Sam is one that uh, constantly tells us, constantly tells us that he is orthodox, that he is creedal, that he takes the positions of the historical church. And yet, I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, this new position, that is, that Israel uh, was not destroyed as a result of covenantal sanctions uh, from the law of Moses, you're not going to find that in the patristics. You're not going to find that in the early church 
in which they ever comment on, on this relationship. The early church very clearly saw that Israel was destroyed because, number one, they killed the Lord. Number two, because they violated the law, their own law. Uh, and guess what? Josephus certainly saw that the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 was as a result of Israel's violation of God's law. Uh, he certainly did not share. Sam Frost knew novel and eccentric idea that, hey, you know, uh, the fall of Jerusalem has nothing to do with God's covenant with Israel, has nothing to do with Israel's relationship with, with, with Yahweh. It's just, hey, things happen. You know, is, uh, nations rise, nations fall, no big deal. Nothing to see here. That's Sam Frost's new position. Covenant played no part in Israel's blessings or cursings. Nothing. And yet it's real interesting, William. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 9 and following, the Lord said that the time was coming in which he would break his covenant with both Houses of Israel. Now remember, this is Zechariah. Zechariah. And I, I, I'm going to pull this up just very, very quickly, if you'll give me just a moment, because I, I want to um, I want to read this so that everyone can catch the power of this. What did I do here? Oh. <laughs> well, I have it here if you want me to read it. Zechariah okay, let, let 11, me pull it. Verse 9. Uh, yeah, let me uh, let me skip down there. Uh, I'll start with verse seven, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we could actually read the entire chapter. The Lord is saying that the time was coming in which He would no more pity the inhabitants of the land, and He says, uh, "I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand, into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land. I will not deliver them from their hand." Now, remember, this is written after after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So he says, uh, I, Zechariah 11, verse 7, So I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular to the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Uh, then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die. What is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff, beauty, cut it in two, that I might break the covenant that I had made with all the people. So it was broken on that day. Well, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord said that the time was going to come when, as a result of Israel's violation of the covenant, he said that the dainty woman would eat the flesh of her own child. Here is the Lord writing or speaking after the fall of Jerusalem in B.C. 586, saying that the time was going to come in which they would eat one another's flesh. And, by the way, folks, let's not forget, Josephus records this taking place in 70 A.D. But it was be in that day that the Lord said... I will break my covenant that I had made with all the people. So in the day in which they ate the flesh, flesh of their own children, God would break his covenant with them. He would bring those covenant curses of eating the flesh of their children as a result of the war. And again, Josephus records this. This cannot be referring to B.C. 586. From B.C. 586 until 70 A.D., there were 19, according to my account in historical sources, there were 19 different sorties, uh, invasions of Judea, but never, ever, ever anything that even closely resembled the war of 66 to 70. And, I mean, you, you, when you talk about those invasions, those conflicts, uh, uh, even those sieges at times. 
neither Josephus or any of the other historians describe anything closely resembling what happened in A.D. 70. Not one of them, to my knowledge, records the inhabitants eating their own children. So you can't point to any other time from the time of Zechariah until A.D. 70 when this passage was fulfilled. That's the point. This was fulfilled in A.D. 70. And by the way, the rabbis agreed with that. I should point that out. And so, and, and the scholars are just pretty clear on this as well. So A.D. 70 is the fulfillment of this passage when they would eat the flesh of their own children. But that's the day, that is the time in which God said, I'll break my covenant with them. So, you know, for Sam Frost or anyone else for that matter, to jump up and to say, well, no, God, God was finished with his covenant at the cross. God nailed the Mosaic law to the cross. Well, hmm, God said he was going to break his covenant in the day when they ate each other's flesh. So that doesn't fit. It just simply does not fit at all. And by the way, this day is not a 24-hour day. It's the generation in which they would weigh out the 30 pieces of silver for the Lord. That's the day. But you cannot dichotomize between the day in which they would weigh out the 30 pieces of silver and the time when they, when they would eat uh, one another's flesh. You can't separate those. It's all in the same day. And that's the point. So again, I, I'm just uh, I'm just staggered when when I read comments such desperate, unmitigated desperate uh, comments uh, from Sam Frost as he attempts as he attempts to deny the reality that the Mosaic Covenant passed away in A.D. 70, and of course others join him. Uh, in, in denying that reality. And by the way, folks, I posted the very first of what will be uh, four or five articles probably. I don't know yet. Uh, but the first of what will be several articles on the passing of the law of Moses based upon Hebrews chapter 9, incorporating all of some of the, some of the material that I've covered here, not all of it. I've, I have yet to finish the article that will deal with Zechariah chapter 11. But nonetheless, I, I'm bringing out all of this material that God's covenantal sanctions would endure until that covenantal wrath was completed. And it just doesn't work to say God's covenant with Israel was removed in A.D. 33 at the cross. It just doesn't work. So anyway, well... Uh, you know, William, we actually discussed talking about something different for tonight, but <laughs> but uh, th this. I see. Th right. You got a little excited from those discussions you were having. Well, I did. I mean, I get so upset uh, when I when I read comments that are so patently false, patently illogical, patently ridiculous and that in truth, they don't even make good nonsense. I mean, let me repeat this, folks. Go to Leviticus 26. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29, and 30. Read those. See how many times God said, if you break my commandments, if you violate this covenant... Here's what will happen to you. I will bring the following on you. And the following was those, quote, natural disasters. He said, you know, the earth beneath your feet will be like iron, and the sun above you will be seven times brighter than normal in a bad sense. It, it, will, burn your, it will burn your crops. Your children will die. Your cattle will die. Your en enemies will hate you. Uh, you know, the, the locusts will consume your crops. You will plant crops, and they will not grow. Now, folks, I, I don't care what anyone wants to say in denial. God said these are the covenantal curses. You violate the covenant, 
here's what happens. And you can talk about what happens to other nations as well. You know, uh, Paul said in Acts chapter 14, God makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So there, there is an equality on some level of the natural processes of nature. That does not mean that Israel was not under a distinctive covenant. It does not mean that God threatened Israel with very distinctive covenantal curses. Now, here's an element, William, that Sam Frost absolutely refuses to deal with. Absolutely refuses to deal with. When Israel was in covenant relationship with God, and when Israel began to violate the covenant, what did God do? He sent his prophets to them to say, you have violated the covenant. If you continue to violate the covenant, God is going to bring you, bring on you the curses of the covenant. All you've got to do is read the book of Amos. The book of Amos is exactly and precisely this scenario. Now, the difference between Israel, covenant, and covenant curses, and let's say China, is yes, China would experience drought, famine, earthquake, etc. But China didn't have the prophets of Yahweh coming to China and saying, you violated the Mosaic Covenant. China never had the Mosaic Covenant. China did not have inspired prophets coming to them and saying, you're in violation of God's law. Here's what's going to happen, oh, let's say in 40 days, if you keep on. Now, did God threaten non-Israelite nations with destruction for sinning? Yes, he did. book of Jonah is a classic example of that. The book of Nahum is a classic example of that. Why did God judge them? Well, it was because of the way they treated Israel. It wasn't because they were in a covenant relationship like Israel was. And so, once, <laughs> well, here I am getting back on my soapbox, uh, uh, you know, about the whole thing. Uh, it's just, it's one of those areas that for someone who comes from a covenantal background to stand up on Facebook and say, eh, what happened to Israel had nothing to do with covenant sanctions. Nothing whatsoever. It's just, it's just the height of arrogance, and it is willful ignorance. It, it, is, it is an arrogance that is just simply unfortunate. And needless to say, it is absolutely against the Word of God. Once again, folks, read Deuteronomy 28 to 30. Read Leviticus 26. And if I'm wrong, somebody, somebody send me an email and point out where I'm wrong on this based on those texts. Just show me, and I'll be glad to apologize for it. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> before I start over again, <laughs> um, you know, William, we, we have been discussing over the last couple of months the, the signs of the end. And... The signs of the end, we, we've demonstrated very clearly, unequivocally, that all of the signs of the end that are given both in the Old Testament and in the New, the signs of the day of the Lord, those signs appeared in the first century. And, and yet, we are constantly told. I, I received a, a post on my, one of my face uh, YouTube videos just the other day. And a guy says, I can prove to you not that Donald Trump is the man of sin, but he's the restrainer of the man of sin. And all of this within the context of the videos that I produced pointing out Donald Trump is not the Antichrist. Donald Trump is not mentioned in Scripture. Donald Trump has nothing to do with being the man of sin. Well, as I've shared on this program before, uh, when I posted those videos, immediately began, people began to attack me mercilessly, saying, I just didn't know the Bible. Uh, I just didn't know anything about Bible prophecy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when this gentleman posted and says, I can prove to you that Donald Trump 
is the restrainer, not the man of sin, but he's the restrainer. Would you be willing to listen? And I posted back, and I, and I, I copied and pasted from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 and following. Paul says, and you know who or what, depending on how you render the Greek there, you, you know who is restraining him, restraining the man of sin. The restrainer was already alive, already at work, already restraining the man of sin when Paul wrote Second Thessalonians. Now, unless Donald Trump is 2,000 years old, it's going to be kind of tough for him to be the restrainer. And so I posted something like that, and you know, in more of a gentlemanly uh, way, I might add. Uh, and I just pointed out, Donald Trump cannot be the restrainer. He was not alive when Paul said this, but Paul said the restrainer is already at work. He's already restraining. You know who is restraining him. I've not received an answer to that. Well, here's something else, and it's related to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is what we want to begin discussing this evening here on this program. You know, we, we are told that in the very, very near future, obviously, that's what all of the dispensationalists claim, in the very, very near future, the rapture is going to take place. Immediately after the rapture of the church, that is, removing the church from the earth, the man of sin appears, and he signs a peace treaty with Israel. Now, mind you, how Lindsay was saying in the 1980s, the man of sin is alive somewhere in Europe today, late great planet Earth, 1980s, countdown to Armageddon. So in the 1980s, the man of sin was supposedly alive, meaning the restrainer was already active. Well, here's the thing. Here, According to Paul, the man of sin was sitting in the temple of God at that very time. He sits in the temple of God. Well, the dispensationalists go to that passage and they say, well, okay, since the rapture hasn't happened, and since the temple that was standing in Paul's day was still there, uh, and since the man of sin had not been revealed yet, that must mean that the man of sin, the restrainer, is still future after the destruction of, of the Jerusalem temple in AD 70, and that must mean that the man of sin will appear after the rapture. He will sign a peace treaty with Israel, allowing Israel to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. Thomas I says that that temple will be rebuilt and, quote, traditional Judaism, unquote, will be restored. And the sacrifices will once again be offered there in that Jerusalem temple. Now, three and a half years into that peace treaty with Israel, uh, and, you know, William, you think about this. How long did it take Herod's temple to be built? Do you remember? What did uh, the Jews say? Well, they said 40 you, and 6 years was his temple in building. Yeah. yeah. But did they continue that all the way up to, or at least refurbishing it all the way up to around 66 AD, right? Yes, indeed. 64 or 65 is my understanding. Okay. All right. So here, the Jews, with with according to Josephus, there were a hundred thousand workmen working on the Jerusalem temple at different times. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to tear it down and rebuild it one day. And of course, they just did not understand Jesus. So here's, here's the question. From the time that the man of sin ostensibly signs a peace treaty with Israel and allows them to rebuild the temple 
three and a half years later, he turns on them and begins to persecute them, and the Jerusalem temple is destroyed. That means, William, that in three and a half years, the Jerusalem temple will be rebuilt. Now, I don't know how they're going to get that done if it took if it took 100,000. By the way, some sources want to say 10,000 workers. Uh, Josephus seems pretty clear that it was 100,000, if my memory is serving me, serving me correctly. I'll have to go back and double-check that. But the point is, Herod had a massive, virtually unlimited workforce available to him to rebuild that temple. And it took 46 years. And we're supposed to believe that the man of sin is going to give Israel permission to rebuild the temple. Uh, Let me see. Let me see here. There's a slight obstacle to rebuilding the Jerusalem temple if you accept the current location of the Al-Aqsa Mosque as the location, as the proper location of the Jerusalem temple. Now, I understand, according to Ernest Martin and several other historical sources, uh, some pretty fine scholars, as a matter of fact, they really believe that the true, the real, and the proper location for the Jerusalem temple is actually, I think it's, what is it, Williams to the south and west of the Al-Aqsa Mosque? Is that right? Is that correct? I can't recall, but I know that it's not on the site where the mosque is at the present time. Correct, correct. Uh, I'll have to go back and refresh my memory memory on that. I've read it a million times and still can't remember it. But, number one, the very idea that there would not be radical, radical, massive riots in Jerusalem by, by the Muslims if they believed that Israel was going to try to build a temple that close even to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. You, you think there wouldn't be massive violent riots if they began to try to do that? Mm-hmm. And, needless to say, if the Jews jumped up and said, hey, the man of sin has given us permission to build our temple right there where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is. <laughs> Don't you know that the Muslims are just going to say, okay, that's cool. No problem whatsoever, dudes. Uh, come on over. Get your bulldozers. Just bulldoze down the second most holy place in all of Islam, or the third, depending upon which view you take. And so we're supposed to believe that these obstacles would be summarily solved, dismissed, resolved overnight, and then this massive rebuilding of the Herodian temple, which, remember, took 46 years, and that's going to occur in three and a half years. That That's the kind of theological gymnastics that the dispensationalists have to go through in order to get a rebuilt Herodian temple. And and by the way, that reminds me, I'm going to have to ask my friend uh, in Jerusalem, uh, my Hebrew scholar, what his view is on the location of uh, the proper true location of uh, of the Temple Mount to see if he accepts the alternative uh, position for the location. That, that will be interesting to ask him and see what, see what he thinks about that. But all of this said, folks, is focused on the idea of the temple. Now, let, let me remind you that in the dispensational paradigm, we don't just have a rebuilt temple we will have what, for better terminology, for lack of better terminology, we will call the Antichrist the man of sin temple. Because after all, he's the one that authorizes it. He's the one that bankrolls it, supposedly. And so you've got the man of sin temple. But according to some dispensationalists, 
That temple is then destroyed. Guess what? By the man, man of sin himself, as he engages in an all-out assault and persecution of the Jews in the middle of this, that 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year tribulation period. So you have the destruction of the man of sin temple in the middle of the, uh, of the 70th week, followed by the three-and-a-half-year great tribulation. At the end of the great tribulation, at the very climax of it, the Jews cry out in desperation for Yahweh to send his deliverer, Yahweh, uh, I mean uh, Messiah, and Jesus comes out of heaven and delivers them, killing the Antichrist and delivering the Jews. The millennium ensues. And then, and only then, do we have the Messianic temple built? Now, according to some dispensationalists, this may not be the dominant view, but it's certainly the view of some. Some dispensationalists believe that Jesus will miraculously, instantaneously, with a snap of his fingers, as it were, build the Messianic temple. Others believe that it will be an undertaking by the Jews themselves, actual physical construction. Now, keep in mind, <laughs> makes, you, makes you wonder about this, does it, doesn't it, William? <laughs> we have been being told, I remember, I remember the late 60s being told there were railroad trains in Wisconsin loaded down with building materials for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We've been reading literally for decades now that the Jews have been gathering materials. They have been training priests. They have been, well, they've been looking for the, for the red heifer uh, to create some ashes, but that hadn't worked out real well for them. And in other words, they are making all of these preparations to build a temple. William, what kind of irony is it that if the dispensational view is correct, the Jews are gathering material to build the man of sin temple. Isn't there something oddly strange and ironic about that? <laughs> well, obviously, you know, there's something strange about it. Um, you know, they're talking about they're going to build the temple when there was a temple already existing, where Paul said the man of sin was already in it. You know, it's some messages that we covered in previous broadcasts. And so to claim that they're going to, you know, do it today is um, just really going to demonstrate how out of sync their eschatology is for the time of the end. I mean, it's, it just isn't going to work. Well, I, I agree. And yet, that's the view that is held by the great majority of what is known as evangelical Christianity today. Now, in all fairness, all millennialists, as a general rule, reject that. Post-millennialists reject that. Uh, although, I've been saying this, you know, to go back to Sam Frost. Uh, and when I debated Joel McDermott, McDermott I raised this point. If, if the post-millennialists and Reconstructionists are looking for a literal physical kingdom on earth... Are they not, or should they not, be looking for the re a reconstructed, literal, physical temple? Because after all, in the proposed temple, in the prophesied temple, which they say will take place on earth, um, guess what? There's a temple, and it's in Jerusalem. So... Um, you know, uh, it makes you wonder how anyone could argue for a future coming physical temple, uh, or excuse me, physical earthly kingdom, and yet at the same time reject the idea of a literal physical temple. I mean, after all, those Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom, which... Our post-millennial friends say is talking about an earthly physical kingdom. They're also talking about a temple. They talk about sacrifices. 
it would be rather disingenuous, would it not, for them to say, oh, well, well, no, 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 that's a spiritual temple. No, those are spiritual sacrifices. Well, wait a minute. Uh, but it's a physical earth? <laughs> Uh, they, these are just some of the inconsistencies uh, that are that abound uh, with uh, with the with the dispensational and the postmillennial views. And, and <laughs> I've got to share this. Uh, one of our listeners, Rod Rupert, uh, <laughs> just asked, just asked this uh, in regard to the. Uh, uh, in regard to the uh, proposed uh, destruction of the temple after three and a half years, <laughs> Rod's got a great uh, sense of humor. He goes, not sure of the laws in Israel, but I wonder if they could get even get the environmental impact statement approved in three and a half years uh, to rebuild the temple. <laughs> and by the way, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is on the southern area of the Temple Mount. Okay, thank you, Rod, for that that correction. But that, that's, uh, that's great. Could they even get an environmental impact statement uh, in order to rebuild <laughs> the temple? That's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> An American t- might take 10 years to get that kind of yeah. environmental I- impact. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but here's the deal, folks. There's no question whatsoever that in the Old Testament, we have the prophecies and the predictions of a coming messianic temple. This lies at the very heart and the very core of dispensationalism. And, and by the way, folks, uh, it, it, I know that you're familiar with Dr. Michael Brown that I've debated twice. I have been trying repeatedly to get Dr. Brown to debate me on one of two issues. Number one, was the restoration of Israel in 1948 the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, yes or no? Or, number two, will there be a restored, literal, physical temple in the future coming millennium with the restoration of animal sacrifices? Now, unfortunately, uh, after our first two debates, Dr. Brown seems entirely unwilling to debate me again. But if you'd like to hear and witness a debate on one of those two topics, let me recommend that you go to Dr. Brown's YouTube video pages and that you post there and request that he please debate me on 1948 or the Messianic Temple, literal and physical, or is it the spiritual body of Christ, the Church of the Living God? Uh, uh, I, I believe that only if Dr. Brown is pressured by his audience to engage in such a discussion is he going to be willing to engage me again. Uh, I, again, I, I have requested, I have sent him emails, I have posted on his YouTube videos, others have posted there, and so far he has all but ignored my request. But if others, and if enough others, were to post there requesting such a debate, it is possible that he would agree to do so because he certainly wants to discuss the things that are of interest to his audience. So let me urge you to do that. Well, again, there, there's no doubt that in, in Messianic prophecy, the temple of God plays a vital and a central role, just as Zion plays a vital and a critical role in Messianic prophecy. Now, William and I are not going to cover the ground again that we covered in our extensive, in-depth discussion of the city Zion in Messianic prophecy. But what William and I want to do this evening is we, we want to begin a discussion of the Messianic temple. What does the Old Testament mean when it predicted that in the coming messianic kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of the Messiah. What is the temple that is in view? Now, I would suggest, William, that next week we we might go over once again 
some of the rules for understanding Bible prophecy that we've covered on this program. We'll have to do it briefly. We're not going to take another 10 weeks discussing the hermeneutical principles for understanding Bible prophecy. But I, I do believe that it's very, very important for us to understand certain foundational rules of hermeneutic that are given to us given to us by the New Testament writers themselves I mean these rules of hermeneutic are explicit and so when we pay attention to those to those hermeneutical rules those rules of interpretation it should help us those rules should guide us in understanding the nature and the identity of the Messianic temple that was foretold in passages throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And as a corollary study to this, we can study the priesthood, the issue of the priesthood, because there's no question at all, and I've said this on many occasions on this program, if we pay careful attention to the Old Testament prophecies, the Old Testament prophecies are very clear, very clear indeed, in letting us know that when the kingdom would be established, it would be radically, and I do mean radically, different from the Old Covenant kingdom. It would not even resemble the Old Covenant kingdom and, to carry that forward, it would not even resemble the Old Covenant temple. It would not even resemble the Old Covenant priesthood or the Old Covenant sacrifices. Now, that's kind of something that you could just kind of sit over here on the shelf, keep it in plain sight, okay? Because we'll come back to that issue. We will come back to the, the, the key claim that I'm making, that when we properly understand the old covenant prophecies of the kingdom, we will very quickly see that the messianic kingdom was not to be, in, uh, in stark contrast to, to what our dispensational friends say. They say that the kingdom that is coming uh, according to according to Thomas Ice, the the new covenant uh, on Dwight Pentecost says the same thing by the way in his massive tome things to come. Uh, Dwight Pentecost says that the new covenant to be established when Jesus comes will not be the restoration of the Mosaic law, although it will be strangely similar to the Mosaic law. <laughs> Well, to say it's strangely similar is a huge understatement because in, in the dispensational paradigm, everything about this so-called new covenant is precisely the same as it was under the old. The location of the temple is the same. The temple is the same, only it's bigger. Okay, The priesthood is the same. The sacrifices are the same. And so when, when the dispensationalists tell us, oh, well, it's not the restoration of the Mosaic Law, uh, but it is strangely similar, th that's just semantics. That, that's, that's sophistry. Because when you understand the doctrine of dispensationalism, then you know without a doubt that it is the same. William, are you there? I am here. Okay. Well, uh, all of a sudden things went totally silent, and I didn't I didn't know didn't know what had happened. No, no I'm here. So, I turned it silent so you wouldn't get any background noise. Oh, okay. Well, uh, there are many many ways for us to begin our study, William, of the Messianic Temple. I know that you've got some passages that you will want to cover. Uh, I have some passages uh, that that I will want to cover. But I want to encourage everyone to be talking to your friends, share the news, especially with your dispensational friends. And by the way, share the news with your post-millennial friends. Share the news with those who have any concept of a yet future physical kingdom that we're going to be discussing the Messianic Temple. 
You know, William, I'm getting lots and lots of static. I don't, I don't know what that is. All right, I'm gonna hit my mute button and see if you're still getting it. Okay. I don't get anything now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's totally silent. It's like I'm talking to a wall here. Uh, but I want to request that everyone who's listening, or that everyone that will listen to the archives. Please share this message that we are going to be discussing the Messianic uh, Kingdom and the Messianic Temple, uh, Messianic Priesthood, Messianic Sacrifices. This is such an incredibly important topic. And by the way, folks, let me encourage you again. Contact Dr. Brown. Encourage him to debate me again. Let's have an honorable, respectful, high-end discussion on whether or not a, there's going to be a yet future, literal, physical, rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. I deny, I vehemently deny that any Bible prophecy has any reference to, any prediction of, a yet future physical temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. I will gladly deny that in formal debate with Dr. Brown, or for that matter, any other well-known, respected, and reputable dispensational representative. This is, this is important, folks. This is very, very important. Because let me make this very, very brief observation as we are running out of time here. If the Jerusalem temple is to be restored with a Levitical priesthood, and some say a Zadokite priesthood, which is still within the confines of that family. And if literal physical sacrifices are to be rebuilt, or, or to be re-offered and re-established, then it also demands that literal physical circumcision will be restored. And I, I want to suggest to you, and this is what we, we will discuss this in depth, in greater detail, as we proceed in our discussion of the Messianic Temple. If those things are re-established, then the gospel of Jesus Christ must be negated, must be set aside. Nowhere does the Bible say, for instance, the Old Covenant sacrifices would be re-established as a memorial of the sacrifice, sacrifice of Christ. That is an invented theological doctrine, invented and contrived out of, out of thin air. Nowhere does the Bible speak of a restored Levitical priesthood. It speaks only of the abolishment of the, of the Levitical priesthood and of the priesthood of all believers who are now able to, as Hebrews 13 and verse 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God, that is, the fruit of our lips. Our sacrifices are spiritual sacrifices, according to Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, which are being offered up in a spiritual temple. So if... The animal sacrifices in a physical temple offered up by a physical, sacri a physical priesthood, if those are restored, then guess what, folks? The one time for all time sacrifice of Jesus Christ will be set aside. The entire work of Jesus Christ, which is the body, which is the reality to which the entirety of the old covenant Cultus pointed, Hebrews chapter 9, 6 to 10. They pointed to Jesus. Jesus doesn't point to them. They pointed to Jesus. And thus to reestablish that temple, physical temple, with a physical priesthood, physical altar, physical sacrifices, is to set aside the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, we can't talk about just the Messianic temple because the temple was in the mindset of the ancient Hebrews. 
It involved everything. It represented Israel's covenant relationship with God. It represented the covenant itself. <clears throat> Pardon me. It was the center of their world. It was the locus and the focus of their identity. When God destroyed the old covenant temple in A.D. 70, it took away once and for all the exclusive, distinctive covenant relationship that God had with a singular bloodline people so that now whosoever will may come and be a part of the city of the living God. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on Two Guys in a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. Please be looking forward to our study of the Messianic Temple in the weeks ahead. William, thanks. It's always great to be with you. With this, I'm going to say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time. We'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.